Hey, this is Paul with MakeUseOf.com. And today I'll be sharing an interesting product that I have stored in this backpack. Opening it up, inside we have the Chasing Mini S. This is an underwater ROV by Gladius. And unlike aerial drones that we see from DJI and Autel, Underwater ROVs are definitely not as popular and not as mainstream. And while there aren't too many options out there, the Mini S is one of the easiest to set up, control, and use, and offers a good amount of features for around that $1,000 price point. But with that, it's still a relatively expensive purchase, and so it might not be for everyone, especially with some of the limitations, not just with this drone, but with other underwater drones that you should be considering before making this purchase. And about a year ago, I actually reviewed one of their larger drones, the M2. Unlike this, which is targeted towards hobbyists and semi-professionals, the M2 is definitely a larger drone that is best suited for industrial applications. And despite the M2 being the more capable drone with its additional motors, giving it more mobility, I actually prefer the smaller and cheaper Mini S because of its smaller size, which allows it to fit into a backpack. But in addition to that, it also makes it much easier to set up and pack. The Mini S features a 12 megapixel 4K electronically image stabilized camera that can help you find good fishing spots, assist with search and rescue missions, take photos and videos, conduct maintenance and surveying, or just give you the experience of feeling like you're swimming underwater among fish and discovering new areas that you normally wouldn't be able to without a drone like this. As you can see, you've got the one, two, three, four thrusters, and then you have an additional one on the back and that is supposed to give you additional control over the drone, they say. On the back here, you pop this out and that's where you attach the tether, which attaches to your controller. And this actually kind of looks like something you would see on a real submarine. This is where you access your micro SD card. If this doesn't offer any additional sensor readings or any other tools relative to the drone aside from housing the micro SD card, I think it would have been better if it was housed on the back here because this just, again, adds to its bulk and size and makes it a little bit harder to fit into smaller bags, like I was saying earlier. This is just an area that you could potentially get snagged on something, especially when you're moving in tighter locations around branches and stuff like that. This drone is limited to operation when it's connected via that tether cable straight to the controller. This means one, you'll have virtually no latency between your controller inputs, as well as the live feed that you're getting from the drone, as well as no signal dropouts, which is great, especially when you're going underwater and you can't actually see where the drone is a lot of the times. But the other thing that you need to consider is, as opposed to a drone where you can literally move almost limitlessly without the worry of, you know, getting snagged on something, that's not the case here. Because if you're moving around in circles and moving around branches and other obstacles that are hidden underneath, you need to be mindful of where those are and where your movements are because you could potentially get wrapped around something. And its built-in features, including its cameras and sensors are impressive, but you can also add additional add-ons to it, whether it's their grabber arm, which is a first party tool that lets you literally pick up or move or manipulate objects underwater, or you can use third party attachments with their GoPro attachment at the bottom to attach cameras. At that $1199 price point, it's Gladius's third cheapest drone, but it's also their best semi-professional drone, and one of the best options, again, at that $1,000 price point that you can get. When purchasing one of these from Gladius's site, there are a number of packages that you can choose from, depending on your needs. In the cheapest 100 meter package, which I have, which costs $1199, you'll get the drone, the remote controller, a 64 gigabyte SD card, the GoPro mounting base, and the 100 meter cable. For $100 more, you can upgrade to the 200 meter package, and that just gives you the 200 meter tether instead. But I think for a lot of cases and most users, the 100 meter cable should be more than generous. I was able to take the drone across to the other end of the lake, and I still had plenty of reach to freely explore on the other side. And it's important to note that while you can get that 200 meter tether, you're still limited to a max dive of 100 meters. The added length just gives you the additional freedom once you're down there to move around at those depths. For $14.99, you can step up to the 100 meter flash pack, which gets you the Grabber Claw B and their backpack as well. This package together will save you about 248, and so it's a no brainer if you're planning on getting the claw. What's cool is this is actually a relatively easy drone to learn how to use after you learn how to deploy it and turn it on. It's actually very similar to using other drones like DJI and Autel. So if you're familiar with those, the layout of those controls is actually very similar in terms of the movement that it translates to with this water drone. And that said, whether you're using this as a professional tool or as a hobbyist, the Mini S is very capable, innovative, and surprisingly practical under the right conditions. And as I'll discuss, similar to the M2 and 
any other underwater drone you're going to be using. There are a lot of considerations you need to make and have in mind before using and actually purchasing one of these. One of which is the actual water you deploy this in. You need to have the right kind of water, one that you can actually see in so you can actually know what you're doing with the drone. So it can't be too murky, can't be too hazy, which is surprisingly hard to find. But two, and this is also very important, you actually need to have an area, unless you're deploying this off of a boat, that's deep enough that the drone can actually turn on and submerge itself in, but that's also clear of debris. Tied in with that, you also need to have an area that you can actually retrieve the drone out of the water from. And so one difficulty I found was sometimes I would find areas that I could actually take the drone off from, I would have to toss it into the water, but in terms of retrieving it, it was actually too high or too far of a distance between ground level and the water that even if I bent over and tried to pick it up, I couldn't reach it. So those are difficulties that you actually face with taking a water drone compared to an aerial drone where you basically can just land in any flat area provided there aren't trees or other debris on the ground. And so with that, those are some of the reasons why a drone like this isn't as easy to take around with you and just, you know, put into any body of water because of all those additional considerations. But in addition to that, while the setup is relatively simple, it is far more complicated than just taking off a drone because you need to have a flat area to take the drone out, attach the tether, and then there's also the drying and cleanup process when you're actually done using it. What's cool is when you do have the right spot and a good body of water to use this in, about five minutes into using this in my first test, I ran into a school of fish, and after that I just found some other cool objects in the water that you'd have no idea were in there, including cans that are just rusting away, glasses, and other weird objects that, again, you wouldn't expect to find in that body of water. And while using it, it did have me wishing I had that grab arm, which I did not have available during the time of this test, just so I could manipulate and just interact with some of the objects, you know, maybe pull something back to shore. I think that would have been a really cool experience. And what was really interesting to me, at least, when I was using this is the drone wasn't even that deep. Like I could still see it. I was maintaining eye contact with the drone. I could see its bright yellow body, but it was just about three or four feet underwater to the point where it was this whole new world I was discovering that again, from surface level, you had no idea was there. And to me, that's the most amazing part about owning and using a drone like this, because unlike an aerial drone where you can take it off and it gives you a new perspective, usually of things that, assuming you're using the drone legally, that you can actually maintain line of sight and see, it's stuff that you could look up and you know it's there for the most part, you know, unless it's like the peak of a mountain or something else unique like that. For the most part, the way people use drones is to get a top-down view of something that they know is already there. Whereas with a drone like this, the photos and videos that you're going to capture with it aren't going to be necessarily as sharp or, you know, cinematic and professional looking. That's not really the purpose of this. Instead, it's to really discover something again underwater that you can take this to incredible depths again if you had the right body of water. But even, like I was saying, three to four feet under, there are still a plethora of things there that are just so incredible to see. And even though I'm right next to it, basically, I had no idea it was there. I think a lot of people who will be getting this drone who need it more so as opposed to hobbyists who are just, you know, trying to have fun and like me discover what's underwater. A more practical use would be fishermen. You know, you're trying to find a spot, you're on your boat, you're deploying this, you want to see where the fish are actually at, move the drone slowly and actually kind of look around and see where the best fishing spots are. I think that's one of the more practical applications. In addition to that, you can also inspect your hull can also do some search and rescue missions. So say for example, you drop something small in the water and you're trying to find where it is, a drone like this can actually make that possible, especially with the addition of the grabber arm, provided it is small and light and can fit within that grabber arm. And you know, if you're a hobbyist and you have the, the money to spend on it, I think it is actually really cool, provided you have a good body of water for it. If not, it's gonna be a harder purchase, I think, to justify unless you have one of those other more practical applications, again, fishing or search and rescue to use a drone like this for as well. And despite being much smaller, the Mini S actually shares a lot of the same specs as the larger and more expensive M2. That includes its max speed, its max depth, its operating temperatures, as well as its camera specs. This six pound drone can descend to depths of 330 feet or 100 meters, and it can operate at temperatures between negative 10 Celsius to 45 degrees Celsius. It has a max speed of two meters per second or four knots, and it has two 4,800 milliamp batteries with a runtime of up to four hours in calm waters or up to one hour at its maximum speed with its two 1200 lumen three level lights at its full brightness. The Mini S also has a total of five thrusters, two vertical and three horizontal, 
and it uses patented anti-stuck motor technology that greatly reduces the probability of the motors getting stuck in the water or sand. And while they don't exactly explain how that works, I believe with the motors being more recessed and with the plastic caps at the top there, it kind of helps prevent larger pieces of debris from getting through. Sand, for example, is still always gonna get through, but when the motors are actually moving, it kind of is pushing it out. I do sometimes find after I've retrieved the drone, larger pieces of sticks or some even rocks and pebbles at the top here that when you shake it out is easily removed. But I've never actually noticed anything both in the use of this drone and the M2 that have ever gotten stuck and prevented the motors from moving properly. Not only that, it also shares the same controller too. And actually let's talk about that for a bit. In hand, it doesn't feel cheap. It actually feels pretty good. And again, the controls are very similar to flying other drones. If you saw my first video, I didn't have too much praise when I was talking about it and I still don't because it's unchanged. But unlike the Mini S, which is just so sleek and compact that it literally fits in a bag, something that was very much impossible with that larger M2 because it literally had a Pelican case. This on the other hand is still very large. And in fact, even with its phone and tablet bracket closed all the way, it's still thicker than the Mini S, which is ridiculous. On the front, you have your on and off. You have these LED lights, which indicate its status and connection to the drone. When the drone is actually on, you unlock it, and then you actually press that button to engage its motors. And then here is where you can actually control the three levels of brightness. On the back, you have your shutter or record stop record button. And then if you have the grabber arm attached, that's where you can actually manipulate it using that right button. On the back you have USB-C and you have HDMI for connecting to external devices. And then this is actually where you plug in the tether. It has that same port both on the drone and on here so the ends of the tether are actually interchangeable. You also have this flip out kickstand here so if you wanted to place this on a flat surface and keeping the drone's controls upward like that you can do so. But in most practical applications I don't think you will especially if you're hand holding this. Now my bigger gripe with the controller going back to its size again is that these sticks are not removable, which you actually have on you know newer drones like the DJI's, which again makes it more flat, compact, easier to pack into a bag. But also the foam bracket at the top, like I was saying, even folded down is still quite large and a lot of newer and more modern controller designs actually have their brackets built in either to the bottom or the top. It would have been really nice to see that, but more than that, this part here just feels so cheap and flimsy. With the exception of this arm here, which is metal, this is all plastic. This really just feels like an afterthought that they just threw on at the very end in order to you know, satisfy the need of attaching the phone directly to the controller. And then so in terms of controlling the drone and its movement, it can move sideways, it can move forwards, backwards, it can tilt up to 45 degrees each direction. One of the bigger differences between this and the M2 is that the M2 can actually rotate 360 degrees and you're probably actually hearing the sound of sand in here because even though I cleaned this off several times after using it, you're always going to have a little bit of debris in here which is also one of the main, you know, kind of downsides of owning a drone like this. There's a lot more maintenance and things that can get stuck in here compared to an aerial drone. Sticking with those controls again, the M2 just has a lot more mobility being that it can rotate 360 degrees and actually tilt up and down up to 90 degrees. So one of the benefits of that is that say you're trying to follow a school of fish or any other object either above or below you, the drone is able to do that and maintain its actual height or depth. Being that this is only limited to 45 degrees, that's actually still pretty good, but you can't be directly above an object or below an object that you're tracking. The other important part of a drone like this, aside from how well it controls, which this does very well, is its camera quality. The Gladius Mini S is using the same f1.8 12 megapixel 1 over 2.3 inch Sony CMOS sensor that we've seen on their other ROVs, including the M2. It provides 4K up to 30 frames per second with that EIS stabilization. The sensor is the same size as GoPro's at 1 over 2.3 inches, though the Mini S might be able to let more light in compared to GoPro's with this larger aperture of f1.8 compared to the f2.8 that we see on most GoPros. Even with that though, you'll still need to rely on its 2400 lumen LED lights to really see anything as the haziness in the water will make things much, much darker. And unless I was using the Mini S at or just below the waterline, I definitely had the LED lights at its max brightness, provided the lighting isn't bad. So if you have enough lighting either coming from surface level or with the use of the lights on board, 
you can actually see what you're doing. Like I was actually able to identify the fish that I was seeing. So in that regard, the camera is very functional. But again, you're, you're talking about the haziness of the water. I wouldn't ever say that the quality that you get out of this is stunning or amazing, but it's rather the things that you're able to capture with this that make you go wow and that make you really want to share it with other people. In addition to that, if you're using this for more professional uses, you're able to identify if there's damage to something, you're able to find things, you're able to help do inspections and things like that. That's where a drone like this is practical, but again, it's not you're not getting it necessarily for the image quality you get out of it. And so the Mini S is actually a very interesting product because unlike the M2, it's smaller, it's cheaper, but in many ways it operates the, the same. You know, unless you're in very treacherous waters or you need that additional mobility that the M2 offers, I think this is gonna be the better purchase for most people. More importantly than that, I think it's actually more practical too because you can easily deploy it and you know, use it as one person, taking it out of a backpack as I've demonstrated, and just setting it up and using it. The controls and learning curve on this are pretty simple, and especially if you're coming from the background of flying other drones, this will be, you know, pretty intuitive too. At $1,100, I still feel like this is a very expensive purchase that it's still gonna be more targeted towards professionals who have a real world application to use this on a regular basis for. On the other hand, this still could be a fun and good purchase if you're a hobbyist, but you need to make sure that you have a good body of water that you can regularly use this in. With the considerations that I shared regarding its deployment, its retrieval, and some of the things you should be looking out for while actually operating this, those should help you determine if this is a good purchase. Thanks again for checking out this video. If you have any questions about this drone, let us know in the comments down below and we can help you out there. This has been Paul with Make Use of, and until the next one, we'll catch you later.